Hello, welcome to our Sabbath School lesson study for this week. My name is Robert DuBose, and um, we are talking about the relationship between education and redemption. Before we begin our lesson today, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the plan of salvation that you have provided for us. We pray that you will help us to appreciate and learn from the Bible, from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus, and from our other teachers. We pray that you will help us to be ready for your kingdom and that we may help our families to be there as well. Send your Holy Spirit to help us as we study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, we want to take a look at the relationship between education and redemption. The Bible tells the story of humankind, but it comes from God's perspective. In the Bible, we see how God educated his people and taught them about his grace and his plan to redeem them. As we look at the relationship between education and redemption today, we want to talk about five different factors that are important for us to understand. Redeeming education, and then the four teachers, Jesus as teacher, the Bible as teacher, humans as teachers, and finally the Holy Spirit as teacher. As we examine redeeming education, we look at Genesis 5.1, and it tells us that in the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Human beings are the only creatures in this earth that are created in the image of God, according to Genesis 1.27. Adam and Eve were supposed to transmit this image of God to their children, but because of sin, their children were born in their likeness and not in the likeness of God. We find this in Genesis 5.3. Each generation that has lived on the earth has been a little less like God's image. The image of God has been gradually distorted with each generation. The purpose of God's education is to restore the image of God in us, thanks to the plan of redemption. This plan covers the whole human history since sin entered the world and right down to the new creation, including Jesus' incarnation. We'll keep studying this plan of salvation throughout eternity. And our reading for the day of Sunday during the week, we want to take a look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we see that we are in the, not only are we the image of God, but we also are responsible for looking after and taking care of the other creatures of God's creation. One of the books that I studied quite a lot in my preparation to be a teacher was the book Education by Ellen G. White. And she states on page 15 that to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Now we want to take a look at Jesus as our teacher. Isaiah 11, 1 through 9, contains a surprising prophecy about the Messiah. Jesus is introduced as a teacher in this passage. He has several aspects as our teacher. He will have the spirit of wisdom. He will have the spirit of counsel. He will have the spirit of knowledge. He will judge with righteousness. And he will decide with equity. This will be the final result of his work as teacher. 
The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Nicodemus was one of the first people that acknowledged Jesus as teacher or rabbi. When Nicodemus visited Jesus at night, he stated, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. John 3, 2. Jesus explained to him that his gift of teaching was a gift from God. In John 3, 11 and 12, God prepares his teachers to carry out his work. We want to take a further look at Isaiah 11, 1 through 9. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears by his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, and with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the Lord will be filled, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We want to spend some time talking about how the Bible works as our teacher as well. In Luke 16, 29, we are told that they, the children of Israel, have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Paul introduced the Bible to Timothy as the textbook par excellence. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Each one of its parts has something we can learn from. If we look at the Old Testament, we find, first of all, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. These books detail how to live according to God's plan for us. And then as we get into the first prophets, we find lessons on how Israel practiced these principles. Then in the later prophets, we learn of the mistakes of Israel and how to avoid them. And then finally, in the completion of the Old Testament, in the writings, we find good and bad practical examples of education. Then moving on to the New Testament, in the historical books, we find much educational content and explain how to teach it. Paul's and other letters contain practical applications of the teachings. And finally, the book of Revelation is an overview of the educational development and its ultimate goal, which is our salvation. Let's read further in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We read further in Ellen G. White's writing, the book called This Day with God, the Bible is the textbook, and it is to be searched diligently, not as we would read a book among many books. It must be to us the book that meets the wants of the soul. This book will make the man who studies it and obeys it wise unto salvation.
Humans can also be teachers in helping us to learn more about God. According to Proverbs 16.23, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. There were many people in the Bible who lived in a responsible, godly way and who worked to help others. Some of those wise people were Joseph, Aholiab, David, Ethan, Ahithophel, Hushai, Agir, Lemuel, Gamaliel, and Paul. But without a doubt, the most outstanding of all human teachers was Solomon. He wrote about plants and animals and composed proverbs and songs. His writings explain how to put all knowledge into practice, that is, to be wise. He encouraged us to pursue wisdom and to use it to teach others. This way will be agents that God will use to teach his people. We find that in Proverbs 9, 9, and 10. Let's look further on this subject in 1 Kings 4, 29 through 34. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, Kalkol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. We freed further. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles, and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Finally, we want to talk about the Holy Spirit as our teacher. 1 John 14, 26, I'm sorry, John 14, 26, tells us that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Before Jesus ascended, he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to continue his teaching work. He leads us to all truth and teaches us what we should say, when we should say it, and how we should say. His education does not rely on human wisdom, but on God's power. It does not follow the wisdom of the age, but teaches God's wisdom. We find this in 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 7. The Holy Spirit can teach us even the deep things of God, according to verse 10. How deep will that education be? How much knowledge will those who are guided by the Holy Spirit acquire? As we read further about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16, and 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We read further. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. 
No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understand it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. And further still, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And we want to conclude our lesson today with a statement that I presented to my students many times over the years as a teacher. This comes from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 49, by Ellen G. White. Now it talks to the youth, but it does really apply to those of us of all ages who are maybe not quite so young anymore. The youth should be learners for the next world. Perseverance in the acquisition of knowledge, controlled by the fear and love of God, will give them an increased power for good in this life. And those who have made the most of their privileges to reach the highest attainments here will take these valuable acquisitions with them into the future life. They have sought and obtained that which is imperishable. May God help us to understand and learn from all the teachers that we've talked about here today and apply that knowledge and wisdom to our salvation. Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the various teachers that you have sent to us to help us to understand the plan of redemption. Help us to apply these principles in our lives and to share and become human teachers to share your love and your plan of redemption with those around us. May we all be together at last with you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.